deeply excited to finally have him on. Uh, he is a founding member of one of the top bands in the original part of the Minneapolis music scene, which a lot of people know. Uh, he is a guitarist, producer, record label owner, and uh, he was in Prince's original band back in, uh, I believe, 1978 and continued on upwards before they started rolling with Purple Rain. He has a new book called My Time with Prince, Confessions of a Former Revolutionary. And without further delay, we're going to welcome to the Upper Room with Joe Kelly, Mr. Des Dickerson. So how are hey, you doing, Des? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. And, uh, you know, you got a book out. Uh, I got to ask you first off the bat, what, what's it like on a, on a book tour and, and promoting the book and as opposed to being just a regular musician? You know, it, it's interesting because... The on, on the the music side, it's kind of like you know things kind of gear up, and then there's this big circus for three months, six months, however long it is, and then it's over. Mm -hmm. But books just kind of go on and on and on. And our approach to it has just been, you know, take every opportunity we can to to meet folks and talk and, and tell them about the book, and you know, so it's it's just a, it's a different thing, it's a different vibe. But I really love it. I, I'm enjoying it. Now, now uh, I understand, and I guess this is good news. the The first pressing actually, uh, you had to go for another one, right? Yeah, we did. We did. Uh -huh. I mean, and and we started out small. I mean, it's it's not on the New York, you know, Times bestsellers list yet. Uh huh. But uh, it, it's been the response has been phenomenal, and we're we're really excited about it. Now, now take us to, uh, you know, the decision to actually write this book, and uh, you know, what what was it like composing, and and how'd you do it? Well, you know, it's funny because. Way years ago, but back in the day, I got all sorts of offers from people to write like a tell-all book in, mm -hmm. in the days directly, you know, after I left the band. And I just, there was no way I would ever consider doing that. And, and at the time, I felt that writing a book would have been somehow, you know, exploitive on my part. Um, and part of that, I think, was just, you know, youthful ignorance. And, and part of it was, you know, genuine in its in its you know quality of character or whatever, right. but over time, as this thing has become more of a, an issue of of history and perspective, um, it seemed more and more that it was the right thing to do. And I guess it was last late last summer, you know, my wife and I were just sitting talking one day, and she said, "You know, you ought to write that book now." Uh -huh. And it just the, the bell just went off. It just felt like, "Yeah, you're right. It's time." And and once I did, once I actually sat down and started writing. It was pretty incredible how quickly it all came back. I mean, literally, I wrote the book in three weeks and um, remembered details that no human being should be able to remember, but it, but it all worked out. Well, I, I guess it helps that you had your mind on straight for, for most of the ride, so that's cool. Oh, yeah, that definitely yeah. helps. Right. So, uh, you know, i, I got to give you a lot of credit because, you know, right in the introduction, you state that, you know, this is just a picture of how, you know, it was when we were, were doing, making music together and not a tell-all book and that you're not out to rip anybody apart. Um, what, what's the pressure like to not add the juicy stuff that, you know, people out there kind of would love to hear and make it still still readable, I mean, and definitely interesting? Well, it's interesting because our, our, our society, our culture is kind of bent toward the negative and the sensational, you know, and if you want to sell a lot of books or if, if you want to sell a lot of movie tickets or a lot of records or whatever, then controversy is, is the way to go. At least that, that's the, the common train of thought. Um, I just felt from a personal standpoint, because I'm, I'm just not that way personally, that it was important for me to share an insight that no one has had the opportunity to get yet, because nobody that was really in the middle of that thing has written a book or has had the opportunity to write a book. So I felt I had something unique to offer. But at the same time, and I mentioned this in the foreword of the book, as you know, um, it's, it's not a tell-all. There's some things that I'm not going to tell. There's some, right, things, right. there's some things I'm going to go to the grave, and, and only me and the other people that were there are going to know. And I think that's the way it ought to be. You know, um, For me, it's just a matter of, hey, th these are my memories, and, and, and these are the things that I want to share with you. And like anything else, you know, there's some things that are private, and, and they're going to stay private. So, so one of one of the great bonuses uh, of this book is some really behind the scenes photo of Des Dickerson's uh, career as a musician before uh, he started working with Prince and Andre and and all the cats in the Prince's camp and and going all the way up towards uh, the the big 1999 tour. Um, you know, I got to ask you when when's that box set for uh, 
Romeo coming out. You know, it's <laughs> funny because we've been getting a lot of requests, and I'm actually kicking around. It, it's just a matter of having the time to put it together. Right, right. Just some kind of a, a retrospective thing with, with, you know, old demo tapes going all the way back to the day through the time the period after I left the band where I was touring with Billy Idol and, and doing some things and, and some stuff that was unreleased from that period as well. So if you just tune in to the Upper Room with Joe Kelly and WVOF, uh, Des Dickerson is our special guest right now and uh, original member of Prince's first band and guitarist and, and confidant all through these years. And uh, his new book, My Time with Prince, Confession of a Former Revolutionary, you can uh, just order it up at your bookstore, Omni Publish Express. Go to desdickerson.com. Would that be the best way through your website? or Yeah, through the website, because right now it's not available at retail at all. It's exclusively available online at, at desdickerson.com. Okay. And probably for the next, you know, six, eight months, it's going to be exclusively available only there. So, so you're on Oprah Winfrey, right? Exactly. Right, Once right. Ron Oprah will bust after Right, that. right. So, uh, you know, let, let's get into some of the... Uh, the early days of yourself as a musician and, and growing up. Uh, you grew up in St. Paul, right? Yeah, sure did. Yeah. Um, you know, what What made you gravitate towards playing music? Um, you know, I, I actually, I grew up in a, a musical home. My, my dad was a musician. He actually, you know, he played in a, a dance band. He, funny, he's originally from a, a little town called Clarksville, Tennessee. I guess it's not that little, probably about 150,000 people or so. And he moved from Clarksville to the Twin Cities, you know, before I was born, you know, married my mom, moved her up, and then, you know, all these years later, I moved from there and moved back down here. Mm -hmm. But um, he he played in dance bands all through, you know, the the South, the Southeast, when he was like 11, 12 years old, and then gave it up to uh, to go into the Navy and then raise a family. And I just grew up around music. You know, one of my earliest memories is waking up in the middle of the night as a, you know, seven, eight-year-old kid and hearing music down in the living room, and I'd, I'd go down the stairs, and there'd be like four or five guys standing around playing saxophone at two in the morning. You know? Wow. So I, I was just around it. I grew up, you know, he, he listened to a lot of, you know, great jazz and, and blues and, and, and different stuff that, you know, influenced me. But, but for me, it was always, what, what always caught my ear was rock and roll for some reason. It was like, I appreciated the musicianship of the other stuff, but, you know, when I heard something, you know, like, like the Beatles or, or like Zeppelin, that was what really caught my attention. And then you played in a bunch of bands, uh, you know, uh, throughout throughout the years. And, and you know, you've been actually uh, pretty fortunate, uh, full-time working musician since you were in your teens, right? Yeah, I actually started playing at 14, went full-time at, at 18, and never looked back. And I have been very blessed and, and very fortunate. I mean, it's just, and, you know, the nature of the business is it's up and down. I mean, there are times, there have been a few times where I've been like, Man, I should have gone to another line of work. But knowing that this is what I'm, I'm made to do, right? Um, I just feel very fortunate that I've been able to do it literally all my life. So, so then when you were around that age and uh, you saw that ad in the newspaper for for a guitarist for a, a up and coming guy who was signed to a big label, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, basically, I was I was playing in, you know, about my eighth or ninth kind of local slash regional band you know i had fronted put together and fronted a bunch of bands from junior high school on and and i was in you know at the time of the band that i put together that was called uh what were we called romeo that's right, what it was. right right and you know we'd gone through the the prototypical you know the, the bass player like went psycho on us and we had to fire him and we hired another guy and the guy that we hired was worse than the guy we fired. And you, Man, know, the, you guys were all living together, right? Yeah, we lived in a band house. Wow. And it was crazy. So I, I was at the point where I'm like, man, this thing is imploded. After, you know, if you've been in eight or nine bands, you recognize the signs, the warning uh -huh. signs. So I saw this ad in this local paper and thought, you know what? Uh, this sounds interesting. I think I'm going to call about this just in case. Right. And, and you went to the audition and... Uh I, th I think a lot of musicians out because we got a lot of musicians that are they're out there could take a, a little bit of advice on how you, you uh, audition kind of just fit in instead of going off with the crazy solos, right? Yeah, you know that's the thing. I mean, the thing about a band is it's it's a team, you know, and and you you have a place, you have a part to play, but you're you're not. The, the team itself and i think that you know especially for a lot of young cats that are trying to impress people sometimes the attempt to impress someone actually is your undoing and, and what ended up happening in my audition is i just went in and and just kind of played rhythm and tried to get a feel for what you know andre and prince and the other guys were doing 
And when, you know, Prince would give me the nod and, and have me solo, I'd kind of solo, say what I wanted to say, you know, play my best stuff, and then go right back into playing rhythm and not overstate it. And it turned out that's what made the difference. He had auditioned over 100 guys on both the East Coast and the West Coast, and every single one of them tried to blow him away. Mm -hmm. I was the only guy that actually tried to fit in. Wow. So so musicians, take Des Dickerson's words on that. that it might help you get a gig, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Worked for me. Right. How, how about um, back in the early days, guitar style, you know, when you were listening to you and Prince, uh, what were the big differences and how did you blend on stage together with two two outstanding guitars? Well, I, I think the big thing is, and, and Prince really recognized this, he, he was really brilliant when it came to, to putting pieces together and finding different elements that were, in some cases, almost opposites, making them work together. And in terms of our styles, I mean, I had come, you know, just from a straight-up rock background, and I had learned to play guitar by, you know, imitating people like early Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page and Jimi Hendrix and, you know, Mark Farner of Grand Funk Railroad, all these guys from the 70s. And Prince's influences, some of them were the same. He was a grand funk fan and that kind of thing. But he also was into Santana and, and um, you know, a, a lot of, like, you know, classic kind of 70s funk stuff and even going back to James Brown. So what we did was we just kind of blended those styles. I mean, he kind of had the funk thing bordering into the rock thing, a la Carlos Santana. But I had the rock thing, and I picked up the funk thing from him, and we just ended up kind of with our own stew, so, so to speak. And uh, you guys continued on. You got the job. And I know I'm going to skip a few years um, talking, and we'll, but we'll get back to all, all the great stuff uh, in between that. But, um, you know, the time, which, uh, you know, great friends of ours here on the Upper Room, uh, you you know, you were involved with Prince and, and Morris and, and stuff that uh, I, re I really thought was enlightening in the book. In, in fact, your contributions to this record, some of our listeners may not know. And uh, how how deep did you get into the first record? And, and maybe we'll spin a track off that one. Yeah, pretty deep, actually. The, the, the way it all came about, you know, Morris and Prince had known one another from, from earlier days when, when Morris was in a band called um, Grand Central. Um, essentially, Morris kind of started hanging out just on a, a friendship basis with us and, and actually ended up on the payroll. And there was a point in time where Prince, you know, kind of cut this deal to uh, kind of, build a band around Morris and make this record on Warner Brothers. And at the time, he came to me, and, and obviously it's all in greater detail in the book, but he came to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some songs for this record that we're doing on Morris, you know, write some stuff. And so I did. And, and really, it, it kind of was the beginning of uh, a collaboration, so to speak, where um, a lot of times he'd call on me lyrically, and he would, he'd give me a title. He'd just call me up and say, hey, Des, here's the title. And I'd, I'd put together some lyrics, call him back, you know, 20 minutes later, half hour later, whatever, say, boom, here you go. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that's how the song Cool came about from the first record. He, he called with the title. I said, yeah, yeah, I got it. I, I get a vision for it. And called him back literally 20 minutes later, and that was it. And and uh, talking, uh, actually reading through the, uh, the book you made mention, you know, I mean, credits ne weren't necessarily on the, the liner notes and stuff, but you, you seemed to roll with it and, you know. What, what's it like as a musician? I know others had problems with that, but yourself, what was your mindset for that? I just always had the, the, the sense that my day would come. Uh -huh. and, and I had kind of, partially because I had I'd been a working musician for nine years before I even got together with Prince and, and became part of what he was doing. So the, the need to kind of have my name out there and be recognized, I, don't get me wrong, I mean, it was still important to me. But in this particular instance, it, was, it became a business thing. Okay. The, the writing of music for other people was more a business arrangement for me. And because I, I was the only guy in the band that was married, um, I just kind of had a different perspective on it. It was business, you know, it was good income for my family. And, you know, the fact that my name was or wasn't on it just wasn't that big a deal for me. And, and at the time, I guess you were the only one in the band saving money, right? That's exactly <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, right. And they laughed at me at first, but the, the laughing stopped after I showed up with the house the first time. Yeah, couple. yeah. That, that'll that make things uh, change. <laughs> so so why don't we give a listen to it, uh, Des Dickerson, uh, contributing uh, lyrics on this one, right? Yeah. Uh, cool, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is the time. We'll come back and speak more with my special guest, Des Dickerson, right here on Minneapolis Music Month, right here on WVOF in the Upper Room with Joe Kelly. The music, the magic coming out from the Twin Cities back way, way in the day. But, you know Des, I got to tell you, and I tell this to a lot, you know, you listen to songs like that and you can't put a, a time stamp on it. That's right. 
It's just it sounds fresh, and you can't say, "Well, that was the '70s or '80s sound." And when you when you look back at uh, you know what you guys created and, and the particular things you've done, do you, do you realize how special you know, like like a P Funk kind of thing, or and the Minneapolis sound that it was just you know one of a kind. You definitely, as time kind of goes on, you gain more perspective on that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing is that as it was happening, I mean, I kind of had this this vague sense that you know what, this is this is bigger than any of us thought it was going to be. I mean, we talked about it being big, but I don't think we really realized. But then, as time goes on, you get a greater sense of perspective, and you realize, man, you know, this is really something that has a has a place in the, in history, and. Um, that's something that's very humbling because you recognize that, you know, h- how did that happen? How did we get there? You know? Right. And, uh, you know, just to refresh our listeners, Des Dickerson uh, is an original member of Prince's band and uh, went on to form his own band and, and toured with, uh, you know, his own project. And on, on tour with Bill, uh, Billy Idol, yeah. Yeah. So, that, so that's cool. And now he is... Uh, and has been for the last 10 years, record owner of AbsoluteRecords.com out of Nashville, Tennessee, which is uh, Christian music primarily, right? Yeah, it's we, we call it faith-based music. Okay, it, faith-based it's music, music that, that uh, approaches, you know, the world from a, from from that kind of a worldview. And, you know, I think it, it's real timely. I mean, with, with the movie The Passion of the Christ and all this going on right now where people are just becoming aware that, man, there's a whole there's a whole world within the world we live in. Right. And um, people are in- investigating, in some cases, reinvestigating um, spiritual truth, and, and you know, not not just goofy things and, and flying saucers, and you know, I'm not talking like woo stuff, but uh-huh. I'm just talking about the reality of there is a God, you're not Him, and it's it's a good thing to have a relationship with Him. Well, I, I thought it's you know, the last few years have been really interesting looking uh, back yourself and and Sheila E and Denise Matthews, before known as Vanity, and mm-hmm. and. Uh, Prince, some some pretty highly publicized spiritual journeys from Absolutely. from back when everything was kind of in a different different flavor with all all the sexual energy and in the lyrics at least. But um, how how do you see it? Musicians really changing in that in that direction, and, and have you been taking note of that? Absolutely, and I think that you know to a great degree because creative people are always looking to push the envelope. They're always reaching for something more and, and you know, to, to try to find something else to express, something else to write about. It's only natural that, that creative and, and especially musically creative people end up having to deal with what I heard, heard Bono once called the big question. Mm-hmm. You know, the big question again, is there a God? And, and if, if there is, you know, what am I going to do about it? And I think that it's only natural for people like Prince and like others to just kind of, you know, come around to that place of recognizing, man, at some point there's more to this than sex, drugs, and rock and roll. At some point there's more to it than just writing another song about dancing, money, or or ladies, you know. Right, right. Do you think it's tough for a musician such as as Prince, uh, you know, when the groove is so funky, yet the lyrics were obviously something they don't want to sing about, to not do that song? You know, I think that... It's an individual. It's an individual choice, an individual decision. For for myself, it just it came to a place a number of years ago where nothing else mattered. Um, if I wasn't being true to myself in terms of the changes that were going on inside of me and, and the desire for for me to decrease, so to speak, and and for me to to to, to let that place in me that that the God that I I grew up with needed to fill. Nothing else mattered. Hit songs didn't matter. You know, sold out concerts didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was was my life being in alignment. And I mm-hmm. think again that for, for a lot of folks, especially like Prince, who have achieved so much, there comes a, a time when it's like, what difference does it make if you sell five more records? You know right. what I mean? What difference does it make if you have another, another number one? Not that all of us don't love that stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, a billion years from now in eternity, I don't think we're going to turn to one another and go. Man, remember Purple Rain? I just don't think it's going to happen. Uh huh. So, so those those are the words of my special guest. And it's a real honor to have him on the show. Uh, his name is Des Dickerson. His current book, uh, "My Time with Prince: Confessions of a Former Revolutionary," and uh, it's available. You go to desdickerson dot com and you can order the book through there. Also, uh, besides all, all the great background and anecdotes, and you know, he was there right at the beginning of when Prince was. Uh, 
you know, getting started in, you know, back in 1978 and continuing up until, uh, the Purple Rain, uh, record was about to be recorded and, uh, toured with them. And, you know, going back to getting the job and, you know, then you guys total rehearsal. I mean, you, you get into it, which you kind of grew to, grew to dislike after a while, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we had that, that, you know, sort of stereotypical Midwestern work ethic thing going on. And, and we all, I mean, I think one of the, um, one of the strengths of the band was we all had this serious work ethic. We all had this serious vision of being th- the biggest band in the world. Excuse me. So as a result, hard work was not something that, that any of us were, were foreign to. But the thing was, Prince had this work ethic that was like, you know, on steroids. And so we would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. I mean, I was accustomed. I came from a background where I was always the guy cracking the whip on the rest of the band and trying to drag everybody else along. Come on, we got to get better. we got to work harder. Well, this was the first time I'd been in a situation where there was actually somebody who was more of a maniac than I was. Wow. And it reached a point where we, we worked so hard at it that it stopped being fun after a few years. Mm-hmm. And, and part of that was just just me. I mean, part of it was just, you know, my time was drawing to a close. But we would rehearse, you know, eight, ten hours a day, and um, that was just the way it was. And I'll give you, you probably know, but uh, he's, he's still doing it that way. I had Greg Boyer on the show, the uh, horn player with him now, and Prince opens up his tour tonight. But, yeah, you, you can see him going that way until he, he stops playing music, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that that's just him. That That's the way he is, and, and that's the way he's wired. And, you know, if you're going to roll with him, you got to roll that way. And, and I definitely, you know, I, I was down with that for the season I was in the band and, and understood and respected it. You know, you guys... At first, did some showcases out in Minneapolis, and uh, you know, didn't get a full tour rolling for for a few years, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it ended up in the beginning. You know, we rehearsed and prepared for several months, and then did a showcase that the uh, the Warner Brothers folks flew in from from Burbank to check out, and they felt at the time that Prince wasn't ready yet. They're definitely excited about the potential that he held as an artist and, and obviously believed in him. They put their money where their mouth was. And and now with the addition of the band, they believed in the band, but they felt that Prince as a frontman, as a performer, as as a you know, a star in, in waiting, so to speak, w- was not yet ready. So they told him they wanted him to do another record and, and just get more prepared. And so that's that's what ended up happening. He went back and did the the second record, uh, the Prince record with uh, I Want to Be Your Lover and some other cuts on it. And uh, we toured after that record was out. Now, how uh, how difficult as a musician for yourself, you, you guys tour with them all the time, but not necessarily recording on, on all the stuff. That was, Is that, that... that was tough in the beginning. Uh-huh. Um, because unlike the songwriting thing that came about with the time later on, I mean, wh- who we were was, you know, performing musicians. So to not play on the records... And only kind of be involved as you know as as band members on stage, um, that was kind of tough. But again, we knew that that was part of the deal, and we knew that we were getting the opportunity. The trade off was Prince had already blazed the trail. He he'd gotten the record deal. He had he had begun to to you know work at establishing his reputation and his position in the marketplace. So we were benefiting from that. So while it was tough, we still understood that that's the way the situation was wired. No, no, it was pretty cool reading about, uh, you know, your love for, for going to New York because, uh, you know, we love New York here and, and just the bottom line because, you know, we've gone, which is, uh, just closed up by the wow, way. Wow. Um, but, uh, your experience going in that club and, and, you know, knowing everybody played there, but then kind of looking like, is this all there is, right? Right. Yeah. It was it was something. I mean, and it was an experience that that ended up repeating itself, as I mentioned in, in the book. But um, you know, the bottom line. I mean, that place was legendary and will always be legendary. And I had come up. You know, I read all the, especially the rock fan magazines like Hit Parader and Rolling Stone and some of the others, and and always read about you know this artist playing the bottom line and that artist playing. And that was. It seemed like the bottom line was the place where you know legends were born. And so when we got the word that we were going to play there, man, I was just like, you know, I was pinching myself. And then when we rolled up the day that we were playing there and walked in, it was like, 
man, this is this is kind of a dive. <laughs> I mean, you know, all respect and everything. Yeah. This, this place is kind of a dive. There's a big old pillar in the middle right. of the stage, and, you know, it was like, man. And you're not going to find too many clean bathrooms at those clubs either. No, man, yeah. not at all, you know, not at all. Dressing rooms were, you know, left something to be desired. But, hey, we were there. Yeah. And, and, you know, the camaraderie when you finally got rolling on tour with the band. Um, talk, talk a little bit about, you, you made mention about, a month on the road as a, as a band and you guys finally get the groove going and, and what's that like? What takes place for bands with, with tours like that? Well, I mean, to me, it's like there's something that happens. There, there's this critical mass that you hit after about a month on the road, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of times young bands now will, you know, they'll talk to me and say, well, we're going on tour. Oh yeah. Tell me about it. Well, yeah, we're, we're going out and, and we're, we're playing like eight dates. That that's not a tour. That's a that's a weekend. That's a long weekend. Right. There's something that happens after you've been out, you know, for at least a month and, and playing, you know, anywhere from four to six dates, you know, straight every week, and you get into this groove and you get into this place where the band gets tighter. A band grows more in a month on the road than six months of rehearsing. There's something about you know you just get into this rhythm and this tempo of it that that just it takes you to another level. And and after that first month is over. Then it starts to just fly by. Then, you know, whether you're out for three months or, or a year and a half, it all kind of blows by, you know. When you were out on tour, was there uh, a lot of testing out new material for future albums and some of those jam sound checks? Yeah, I mean, uh-huh. some some of the stuff that, you know, later on were, were hits that everybody's familiar with were songs that we played in, in you know, the back of the bus, songs we played in, in sound check. Um, you know, I would die for you, Raspberry Beret. I mean, on and on and on. There were songs that were born in sound checks and hotel rooms and in the back of the bus. So, a lady who was, uh, you know, you've been together with for a long, long time and really dear to your heart and uh, supportive of, you know, you, you guys work on the record label together too. Your wife, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah Becky, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. How how is you know now things have changed to yourself torn you know all this rock and roll lifestyle, but. Being being uh, a musician and getting married, uh, I guess a somewhat young age. What, what's that like, and what, what was that like for your wife? Well, you know, for us, I mean, we we've been together for, from an extremely early age. We actually met in high school, um, and we've been together, you know, since then. We've been together thirty one years, so we we grew up with that. I mean, you know, a lot of people grow up with. You know, they they grow, they kind of grow up through the college experience, or they uh-huh. grow up through some other. For us, we literally grew up through the rock and roll experience. So, I mean, our first date was was me taking her to somebody else's prom because I was playing. You know, right. <laughs> so that whole thing was just kind of a natural progression, and I think at the point where we got married, I mean, we literally, I, I came home from the Dirty Mind tour directly, <laughs> directly from we were in Europe. I came directly from the airport. Um, after flying, you know, 14 hours overnight, not getting any sleep, went directly to our wedding rehearsal and got married two days later. And and that's just kind of the, the story and, and the flavor of, of our relationship. You know, after we got married, my wife started going on the road with me. After I left the band, she actually became my road manager through the, the time that I was on the road with Billy Idol and, and doing all the solo stuff. And, you know, when, when I started the record company, she started working with me. So that's just kind of the, that's the tempo of our lives. And it's been at times extremely difficult it's not an easy lifestyle especially the uncertainty of it and there are times when uh you know because and you know don't send me any letters about being chauvinistic that men are from mars and women are from venus and there's some differences i mean for for my wife and for most women that aspect of of knowing where your your home and your security is is kind of constantly up in the air because music's just not a stable business but um, she's a special lady, and, and um, you know she's known that that's that's kind of what I'm about from the beginning. And she's you know much to her credit um, rolled with it all these years. So uh, if you are just listening to the show, uh, Des Dickerson is my special guest right now, original member with Prince of Prince's first band, and continuing on uh, through the Dirty Mind tour, through the Controversy tour, 1999 tour. That's the first tour I actually saw you guys in, which was really cool. It was a great tour. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then he has a new book, My Time with Prince, Confessions of a Former Revolutionary, which is uh, available directly through Dez's website, DezDickerson.com, D-E-Z Dickerson.com. And he's based out of Nashville, Tennessee right now. And 
Um, how, how about moving down to Nashville? What, what was the uh, decision to go down south? You know, it, it's wild. I was um, in 87. I was working with a, a young guy named Judson Spence who was uh, being pursued by a number of major labels. And an agent friend of mine um, asked me to just, you know, come out and, uh, and, and tour with him. Just, you know, he needed somebody that could help him to establish some legitimacy and they needed a name, so to speak, and, and for whatever reason they called me up. But in the process, we were kind of based in Nashville for a couple of months, and, and I, I got the flavor of the town and, and kind of, you know, offhandedly thought, you know what, I, I could live here. I mean, I'd never leave the Twin Cities, but, but I could live here. And a few years later, you know, my wife and I, and I can't really describe it any other way, we just kind of felt this kind of divine tug on our hearts, like, well, you know what is to whatever degree I'm able to understand, you know God's will. I think we're supposed to move. She agreed, and um, right about that time, I got offered uh, a, an executive position with a record label that was based here, and that kind of sealed the deal. And we've been here ever since. So, so it's cool down there, and, and your son's uh, involved in music too, right? Yeah, my son's yeah. actually uh, he's he's in a band that's uh, on our label, actually. He started out in a band called Squirt that was on our label, started out very young, you know, 10, 11, did a couple of records, and now they've kind of morphed into a new thing, a band called Lenny, and uh, we're just starting pre-production on a new record with them, and, and really excited, very talented young guys. So, uh, you know, why don't we get into an, uh, another song as, as we chat and come back and talk some more. Uh, I know we're jumping around music-wise, but uh, this, this double LP, 1999, was uh, j just incredible blend of funk and rock and you guys you did it right and, and the tour f followed right after that but um a lot of people know you uh from the the videos that came out of this record little red corvette and and your guitar which you know brought to mind it's really cool how you guys recorded that and your guitar take us into the recording process for that well, like a lot of things, you know, we, we would do things in kind of bits and pieces and stages, you know, with, with Prince kind of being the guy that was at the center of it all along, and the rest of us were kind of, you know, brought in and out of it. But um, Prince called me up one day and um, wanted me to come over and, and hear some tracks that he'd been preparing for the new record and, and had some stuff he wanted me to play on. And when I got to the house, you know, he, he put up the tracks for uh, Little Red Corvette and said, you know, I want you to do a solo on this song. And, First of all, he kind of wanted to know what I thought about it, and I just told him, I, I, "Man, I think this is this is the most commercially viable song that that we will have ever put out." And um, you know, I just kind of plugged in and and just uh, he started just letting the tape roll, and I just started playing some stuff, and we kind of did, you know, we took two or three different passes at it and, and recorded all of them, and ended up doing what we call a comp, where you take parts of of you know different solos. And you assemble them into one solo. And, um, you know, I probably played, again, total of maybe, you know, 20 minutes, half hour or something. And, and that was it. We got what we needed. And, and ironically, you know, years later, I guess it was about three, four years ago, Guitar World magazine named it one of the, the 100 greatest guitar solos of all time. And <laughs> it was kind of like yeah, I just rolled in and played and left. Right. Well, well you know, I think you might have made mention it was almost impossible to replicate, right? Just yeah, it was live. difficult. Yeah. I had to relearn it because essentially I had, I had played at least three different solos, as I recall. Uh -huh. And, you know, each solo has its own sort of train of thought, its own kind of beginning, middle, and end. And, and one of the things that, that comping does is give you kind of a unique take on, on a solo because it ends up taking turns that you wouldn't normally think of while you were actually playing it. And so I had to take you know, the comp version and relearn it because it, the phrases weren't things that I would normally put together if I was just playing a solo. So we'll give a listen to it right now, the work of Des Dickerson and Prince from the 1999 album. This is uh, Little Red Corvette, and we will talk on more with Des Dickerson in a few moments right here at WB. Great guitar solo on there, my special guest, Des Dickerson. And uh, I want to thank Des for spending part of his afternoon with us here. Okay, and uh, that's Little Red Corvette. And Des Dickerson, uh, original member, working with Prince, Andre Simone, Dr. Fink, Gail Chapman, Lisa Coleman, Bobby Z, Rivkin. And, and uh, you know, i got to ask you, how much, you know, you've been away from Minneapolis music, and how much do you stay in touch and follow up on Prince Prince's music and some of your old comrades back there? Do you get a chance? 
Yeah, a little bit. You know, I, I try to stay somewhat on top of, of what Prince is up to. And, and you know, I, Bobby Z and I talk, you know, several times a year. Um, he's probably the one that I stay in contact with the most. Um, talk to, to uh, Dr. Fink, talk to Matt a few months back, and, and he's doing well. And, you know, it's one of those things where it, I guess it's kind of like being in the Army together or something. I mean, right. there's, that, there's that, that bond that you'll always have. And even if you don't talk to one another for, you know, 10, 15 years, when you do talk, it's like it was yesterday. So, How, how about yourself and Prince? Do you guys ever stay in contact? Or you know, it's, while? it's funny. I, I definitely am, am diligent to at least be in touch once or twice a year. We have not talked directly, like a con- an actual conversation face-to-face, since back before I left the Twin Cities, which is now, you know, going on 14 years, I guess. Mm-hmm. But um, we're we're in contact through intermediaries. I mean, we've a few years ago when I was working on a solo record, you know, we were in touch about him possibly coming in and, and doing something on the record, but we never spoke directly. We spoke through his assistant. and um, It's it's kind of the way he prefers to communicate, it seems, these days. Right, right. But, uh, you know, it, like I said, I mean, it's one of those things where I, I'm committed to, to staying in touch and yeah. uh, and doing my part. Make, make sure they have a guitar ready for you in case in Nashville, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, the guitar and, and some rust-oleum, because I, I don't play that much anymore, but. Right. Yeah, but but that would be cool, you know. Yeah. You never know. So, yeah, talking about, uh, you know, I guess I was going to ask you about um, your own music. And Do you still do a lot of writing yourself, or are you basically involved with uh, the overseeing of your own record company? Yeah, the big thing for me is it's it's overseeing the label and being involved in, in developing. The biggest excitement now is, is drawing out of other people what's in them. Mm-hmm. So it's not so much about me playing or me singing or, or you know, me writing as, you know, helping other people to become the best that they can be. And I still, you know, I'm, I'm planning to, to start another uh, second solo record here, probably toward the end of this year into early next year. And I'll still, you know, every once in a while do something when I feel I have enough songs that uh, that need to be heard. But, um, yeah, it's more, I, I tell people I play the telephone more than anything. <laughs> right. Is. How, how about, uh, let, me, let me ask you about this, because, uh, you know, there's some legendary stories uh, which you touch on in, in the book uh, My Time with Prince uh, from Des Dickerson. One of them, um, you clear the air, and you were there, so you know I, I think you have the right right uh, insight into this. The uh, the Rolling Stones uh, double show uh, experience out there, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you know I guess to refresh our listeners, you guys played two shows uh, with a, a day off in between. Right, and uh, the first the first night was a bit rough, right? First yeah, day, it, yeah, it was. We played uh, two shows a Friday afternoon, and the second one was scheduled for Sunday afternoon. We were the first act on. Um, you know, the bill was us, um, George Thorogood, and the Destroyers, the Jay Giles Band, and, and the Rolling Stones. And um, you know, we went on like early afternoon, and that first day. I mean, really, after the the first song, I will never forget the sound of it. I mean, there were 110 plus thousand people at the show at the LA Coliseum, and and the ovation after the first song was amazing. I mean, the, the sound of of that many people making that much noise is something you never forget. Um, during the course of the set, though, because obviously, if if you look at that bill, you look at George Thurgood, Jay Giles, the, the Stones. There's a common musical thread that kind of runs through all three of them. Um, we were kind of the odd man out in terms of just our style and our vibe and everything about us. And there were some people that got it, but I would say most people got it, but there were some people that didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, statistically, they say that in any given public setting, at least 5% of the people you encounter will decide right off the bat, out of hand, that they don't like you. Now, take that and apply it numerically to a crowd of 110,000 people, and that's over 5,000 folk. Right. That, that's a sizable amount of people that have decided they don't like you. <laughs> and and in, in our case, because of the fact that we hadn't, we, Prince as a, a front man and as an artist hadn't faced a hostile crowd. You know, we as a band, ha, at least in this band, had not played in front of anything but adoring fans up to that point in time. So at, at the point where there's, you know, there's some folks that, that definitely don't want you up there, even though the, the majority, the vast majority do, you're faced with a decision at that point. And, and that's what ended up coming down. And uh, Prince left the arena, flew flew back to Minneapolis. And, yes, he and, did. And, he, you know, throughout the book, you, you spoke on 
Prince actually turning to you as a confidant and, and really asking you for advice and kind of setting them straight. And you were you were the one, despite all the the manager and, and Mick Jagger, uh, getting him back for for the next show, right? What what happened during the phone calls? Well, you know, it was just it was something that I was always very again humbled that that he had that kind of confidence in me. But I guess I kind of played almost like an elder brother role in in the band because you know I I just. I'd been around the block. I'd, I'd, I'd done it for a while, and I just wanted to be there to lend whatever help I could to make things go smoother. And in this particular instance, what had happened is, you know, he, he left the Coliseum, flew home, wasn't going to come back. And, you know, his managers called him, tried to convince him he wouldn't come back. Mick called him and tried to convince him he wouldn't come back. And and uh, one of the management people called me in my room because, you know, we were just <laughs> hanging out in L.A. hoping he'd come back. Um, and they asked me to call him. So I called, and we, we talked for about 45 minutes, man, and I, I just kind of said, you know, we, we've worked so hard and we've been through so much, we can't let them run us out of town. We, we can't let, you know, the, 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 the legend, you know, get out there that, you know, an audience stared us down and won. And I said, no matter what, we got to finish this. And, and he was reluctant, but I was able to appeal, because, again, there was that sense of team I was able to appeal to that sense of, you know what, we're in this together, let's finish it together, and he came back. And you guys played it straight through the uh, the second show, and mm-hmm. although it was a little rough, I guess. but Oh, yeah, it yeah. was a harrowing experience. Right, right. And, uh, but I loved it. Now, now another thing which is which is legendary is that, that big food fight backstage yeah. with uh, on the Dirty Mind Tour, right? Or Controversy Tour. Controversy Tour, right. Yeah. What, what was going on that, that night that you guys just, everything broke loose? Well, you know, it, it it had been building in a in a good natured kind of way. Um, you know, the and, and all this is documented in the book. But there was some tension that had built up between Prince and the time, just due to the the nature of the gig and, and their status. And, and they felt, you know, because actually now that I think about it, it was on the 1999 tour because they had been playing kind of behind the curtain as Vanity Six's backup band, right, right. plus doing their own set. And they were feeling, you know, that, that they were stars in their own right, probably rightfully so. They were selling records. They, they had some hits on the radio, and the crowds were absolutely just going crazy every night. So there was just some good-natured animosity that was building up, and it started to manifest itself in little things as we got further and further into the tour. So it was decided that we were going to kind of blow off massive steam by having this huge food fight at the end of the tour. And they, they set it all up, let the arena know what was going on, um, and, and just basically had it set so that, you know, we could do whatever it was we needed to do, and, and they would just clean it up later. And, and one by one, the, the time members were forcibly taken off stage, even Jesse uh, handcuffed so he couldn't play during the set, right? Yeah. See, originally the, the, the plan was, the stated plan was, okay, this big food fight was going to happen after the show backstage, they were going to rope everything off and everybody was going to clear out except for the two bands. And we had like thousands of dollars worth of food we were going to just like battle it out with. But we decided, no, we'd take unfair advantage. And we started kidnapping them off stage <laughs> during their set right. and having guys replace them one at a time. And we did actually snatch Jesse, took him back to our dressing room and handcuffed him to this coat rack and just pelted him with everything. I mean, whipped cream pie, everything. I mean, he was just covered from head to toe. And that that it was on then. Uh, you you couldn't get uh, jelly bean off the stage, right? No, I couldn't get <laughs> jelly bean. <laughs> I don't think it had that. Uh uh-uh. Yeah. So uh, you know that that's cool. All all the all the camaraderie and sometimes you know less than friendly things that go on the road. But I think you know I I think a really touching part of the book, which which I I got from it, is when you talk about uh, Big Chick Huntsbury, mm. and uh, you know the relationship that you got and you know, first meeting him, and that was really cool how you, you know, sidled up to him on the bus when everybody was kind of just staring at him, right? Yeah, Chick was, uh, he was a huge man, and he literally, he was so big that that Prince was afraid at first. I mean, I had run into Prince in, in the hall in the hotel earlier that day, not knowing who he was. So so who would suggest management to, for Chick to get get the gig or yeah oh, yeah okay. the management would would just bring folks in because they were kind of networked into the that whole community of road managers and bodyguards and that whole thing because they'd the folks that managed us had managed earth wind and fire and little feet and all these sort of 70s and 80s artists and in fact one of them had gone all the way back to like the 60s and the love and spoonful that that whole kind of old school thing but mm-hmm. 
but they brought Chick in, and and uh, I got called into a band meeting, you know, after running into the guy in the hallway earlier that day, and and uh, you know, lo and behold, I see this big guy that I ran into in the hall sitting in the room, and, and he's introduced by our road manager as as the the new bodyguard, and so we kind of had a brief conversation. They sent Chick out. And then Prince says, they, they need to send him home. We need to fire him. He scares me. He's too big. <laughs> and, and they told him, well, just, you know, just give it a day or two. And so we had a day trip that day. We were going from somewhere in Virginia to somewhere else. And everybody on the bus is like, you know, sitting like 15 feet back from this guy. He's sitting up toward the front in the seat all by himself. And everybody else is sitting back like he's King Kong or something. And finally I said, this is silly. I just went up and sat down next to him and just said, so man tell me your story you know and and it turned out he was the most interesting guy Uh just friendly just a sweet just a big old teddy bear just a sweet guy and we ended up becoming great friends obviously you know not only did prince keep him on but but he ended up becoming prince's right hand in literally every way right and uh you know chick and i ended up being just dear dear friends until his untimely death and you said you're going to see him uh, once again. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. Because Chick, toward the end of his life, he uh, early on, he, he had been uh, a born-again Christian and had a bad experience um, with some people that, that were false in, in what they were doing. And, and he got mad at God and, and kind of ran the other way as hard as he could. But toward the end of his life, he came back. And he actually spent the last year of his life as an evangelist. And, uh, you know, Chick and I had the, the great privilege of, of a, a, on a couple of occasions kind of being involved together in some church services because I actually ended up getting ordained in the late 80s myself. And uh, good man, and I will definitely see him again. So uh, my special guest right now is Des Dickerson. Uh, he is a really great musician, guitarist, producer, label owner. Uh, and uh, you can go to the website absoluterecords.com, which is his record company out of Nashville, Tennessee. But he has uh, written an excellent book, and I, I told him off air that... Uh, you know, he sent in the mail kindly, and he and he signed it. Life is more than a party, Des, which is real cool. And you know, I, you know, I like to read, but I don't read that fast. And I think you could have clocked in as as the most, you know, most interesting, fastest book I read in a long, long time. And uh, you know, it's it's some great stuff. And you you said you found people been really gravitating once they get and really getting into it, right? Yeah, we, we've just been really, really encouraged. People are saying that they, they can't put it down once they start reading it. And, um, you know, that was my highest hope for the book. I just really hoped that it would be something that would be engaging, that folks would read it and feel like they were there and experience it. And, and that's right. what, what people are telling us. So we're real excited about that. Now, now inside the book are some photos which you, many of us, including myself, have never, ever seen. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you got plenty more to go for the next book, right? Oh, yeah. And, in yeah. fact, we're actually kicking around the idea of doing just a kind of a photo album, so to speak, and putting out a book that's just photos here next. Um, but, yeah, they're all personal photographs. I mean, literally, it's, it's they're my scrapbook. Um, you know, through that experience, <clears throat> I took a lot of pictures, and, you know, people would take pictures and send me pictures. And, and so I have stuff that I've had for all these years that have never, literally never been seen outside of my immediate family. And when we were putting the book together, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to include some photographs that have never been seen publicly at all? So so you got a picture of the band playing flag football. Who, who are some of the best athletes on, on, the, on the crew? Well, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I was one of them. Uh-huh. But, <laughs> but actually, Terry Lewis, um, you know, of, of Jam and Lewis, w- was a very good athlete, uh, also, um, Jerome Benton, very good. Both of them, very good athletes, very good football players. Mm-hmm. And I would say probably the three of us were the best out there. Right. At one point in time, I, I was kind of on the fence. Am I going to play football? Am I going to play music? You know, but, but music won out. So, so was that advisable to, to go hard at and on tour playing football and, and basketball? It wasn't advisable, but right. we did it anyway because <laughs> right. we were about half crazy. Yeah. I mean, that, that was kind of our one outlet. You know, we, we didn't, you know, we, we didn't do drugs. We, you know, there was not a lot of heavy drinking going on, but, but you know, playing ball was definitely a big outlet for us out there. And, and the book, My Time with Prince, Confessions of a Former Revolutionary, is available right now direct uh, at desdickerson.com, D-E-Z Dickerson.com. And uh, before we get into another uh track before we say goodbye i wanted to ask you towards the uh the waning years on tour 1999 tour and then uh 
I guess, parting ways with Prince uh, prior to the recording of Purple Rain, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what was your mindset and and, uh, how did you guys end it at that? Uh, Take us back to those days and what was going on. Well, you know what? There, everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end, mm-hmm. and y- you you gotta develop the ability to recognize when your end is coming. For me, it the thing that caught my attention was the fact that I was changing in ways that were not positive, and it really, at the end of the day, didn't have anything to do with anybody but me, because I knew at some level, at some unconscious level. I was just coming to a time where it was time to me to move time for me to move on and um as a result I, I was I was not an easy guy to work with I was not an easy guy to be around because I just wasn't happy um anytime you start to kind of you know overstay your time um you'll you'll get at odds with yourself and so I I just came to a place after the 1999 tour ended where I knew I, I needed to make a decision and um you know just thankfully at, at that same time um you know prince had uh, had called to get together because he wanted to talk about you know what was going to happen in, in the next three years of of you know the, the band's existence and to ask me to kind of you know kind of re-up so to speak and that was the point where i knew no i i, I can't i know that i can't commit to three more years but he graciously you know extended the offer for his management people and and so on to to help me make my transition into a solo career and and uh, again just just gracious to the end and and we we parted amicably parted good friends and and I left knowing that that you know my season had served a purpose and that I had had a great time but that it was time to move on and you're also spotted in uh performing a little segment of Purple Rain Modern Air mm-hmm. and uh is there a full version of that song you know there is and it's funny there's there's actually pretty great demand for that song right yeah. now. The funny thing is, I don't have the master, oh, um, okay. and and I don't know who does. <laughs> oh, right. uh, so we're we're you know at some point looking to track that down and and make uh, some sort of arrangement to to release that song. But yeah. So if you're out there listening and you got Des uh, Dickerson's song Modern Air, uh, hey, give it up. Yeah, DesDickerson.com. Email him and uh, you know give it up. That's right part of musical history and i i've actually heard like a loop version so i don't know if you ever heard that somebody took just the movie part and just looped it for like four minutes wow <laughs> so they, they want the whole thing to hear <laughs> <laughs> yeah i yeah. guess by now right so uh i gotta thank you des really so much for for stopping by the upper room with joe kelly and hope to have you here in connecticut one day yeah, I definitely plan on it. I've enjoyed it, and it's been my pleasure. But definitely, uh, I will pop in up there someday. And uh, most importantly for our listeners, um, this is a part of uh, musical history. Uh, Prince recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Des Dickerson was there at the beginning, touring, recording, and and uh, being a friend uh, with Prince. And uh, you know, it's a great perspective. It's not a who's sleeping with who kind of dish all. You know put somebody down it's a straight up talking about being a musician and on the road and what happens and you know you know thank thanks for putting it down all in a book well it was my pleasure and uh i just uh hope that folks enjoy reading it as much as i enjoy writing it so it's available directly desdickerson.com so uh, another song off 1999 uh the title track which uh you're involved with uh Take us uh, into the studio. And what was Prince's idea to include uh, the band in there with the vocals? Well, it started out he um, he recorded us basically uh, doing harmonies with one another, myself, um, Wendy, and uh, Jill, and and Prince. And he had recorded everybody. I think I was the last one to do my vocals. And and again, it started out as like a three part harmony kind of thing, a three or four part harmony all the way through. And when I did my tracks, that's what I heard it as. But later on, when he did the final version of it, he instead opted to divide it up into separate like lead vocal lines. So everybody kind of sang their own line in the final version of the record, which is, of course, the way we ended up singing it on tour. But interestingly, it started out as just this big harmony. And in the video, they, re- they reshot part of, part of you in there, right? Yeah, when we when we shot the original video, um, there was something that went wrong in processing 
with one one of the the lines that I sing in the song. So they actually ended up bringing in a video crew on the first date of the tour in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And there's that Tennessee thing. Yeah, again. right. <laughs> and and reshot that line and then edited into the the original footage that one shot. So if you look real closely. Um, I think it's the line when I woke up this morning could have sworn it was Judgment Day. That it, there's a slightly different feel visually to that piece. That's because it was shot, you know, a month later in a different city. So we'll listen to it right now. Des Dickerson, Prince, and uh, this is from the 1999 album. And uh, well, Prince says he's not going to play those hits after a while, so I, I we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, th- this is just a. A song you never get tired of. And uh, DesDickerson.com for the book, My Time with Prince, Confessions of a Former Revolutionary, Des Dickerson. So thanks, Des. It's been my pleasure. Thanks.